Thank you all for coming here. My name is Penny Wright. Many of you we know, and some of you have come to a bunch of our armchair traveler programs. Um, and some of you are maybe first time attendees, but basically once a month we'll have somebody come in and talk about his or her trip. We have several interesting things coming up. Actually, the next armchair traveler program we have is Richard and Roseanne Barron's who are going to come in and talk about St. Martin, but now, as you know, St. Martin is not its former self, so they'll talk about the old St. Martin. Um, in February, we have some people coming in to talk about a swimming vacation uh, that they took off the coast of Turkey. Um, those of you who are in our library district get our newsletters. But some of you may not live in our district. In that case, please take a newsletter because we always have a lot of things going on here and we, we would love to have you at our events. Um, so we cast around a lot to think of who we may know, who may travel, who may be willing to do something like this. And we were really happy to land on two of our favorite people, Faye Henderson and Greg Munsky who've lived in Southampton with their daughters for a long time. And some of you probably know them. They've been here for over 30 years. Actually, Greg used to be a DJ for a number of years. He had a jazz program at the college radio station. Blues. And he, I'm sorry? Blues. Jazz blues. Oh, jazz blues. And he had a, he went by another name, which was, what, what was your radio name? Uh, the one I can say right now, it was um, uh, Gregory Scott. Gregory Scott. So some of you may have heard him without really knowing you or hearing him. Between the two of them, they have collected a few art degrees, raised two children, and had four pet German shepherds. Uh, Faye has designed a number of local pools and gardens, and Greg has taken care of some big estates and enjoyed uh, his work also as a radio DJ. They've been in business for a long time and are in business together. I think they're entering their somewhat slower season, which is why they're here tonight. Um, Greg told me that he used to like peanut butter much better when he was younger. And recently, both of them dis discovered how much they like to drive around and take pictures. Please welcome Faye Henderson and Greg Munsky. The, the whole reason that we did this trip was actually, uh, the catalyst for doing this trip was that they had a high school friend that she had not seen in 40 years that lives in Tucson. So we thought, let's go to Arizona, take a big trip around, and then see her high school friend. And so that's what started it. And then the other night, I, I have to say a couple of nice things about this was that Faye said to me, you pick where you're going to go don't involve me, and so I got like 10 travel books and read through them all and then started tagging stuff that I thought would be interesting. And then um, I realized too that you know, like if you're going to do a big trip, grab like 10 travel books because several of the travel books didn't even mention the things that the other travel books had in them, so it was good to cross-reference everything. So to start our trip, we flew to Phoenix obviously, and this is, um, I always take pictures out the window of the airplane. So this is like not even Grand Canyon. This is actually uh, Salt River Canyon as we were flying to Phoenix. So it has nothing to do with the trip really other than just getting there. And uh, so, all right, let's get started here. Um, flew into Phoenix. Our first idea was to actually, uh, I don't know if this map really helps much, but it's actually, um, we went from Phoenix, we were going to go to a place called Montezuma's Castle or and. Right near that is a place called V Bar V Ranch. And the other idea we had in this trip was that we were not going to go to museums, we weren't going to go to art shows, we weren't going to do any festivals. All we wanted to do was see the landscape, if we could do that. And so uh, there was a lot of um, petroglyphs at V Bar V Ranch. And so the little red mark on there is actually, as we were heading to V Bar V, then we thought, oh my god, look how late it is. 
we have to immediately eliminate from our, that from our trip. So our, our real problem was the first day we flew in, we just like lollygagged around until like 11 or 12 o'clock, and so we had to eliminate a couple of our things. From then on, we were like up at seven, we were on the road, and uh, the other big thing that was really important about the trip was that the first couple of days, we would go from place to place, stay there until dusk, and then drive. I had it all set up where we would go to a place, had a hotel reserved, go to that hotel, wake up, and then where the hotel was right where we wanted to be to look at the next thing, then go to the next hotel, and it was right there. So the next every day we woke up and we were near the place we wanted to be. The problem was, as we started driving at dusk, we completely missed the countryside, and it's just absolutely just incredible. I mean, it's just anywhere you look at any time, it was really amazing. So. So we started off and we turned around from Montezuma and then on the little chart and things that I were looking at it said um, scenic route. So I thought okay, we'll do the scenic route and uh, where we went was, uh, this is like, this is what you're looking at and you drive into Phoenix and you start driving around, this is what you see. Uh, Saguaro practice everywhere. Uh, so we decided to go on the scenic route, and the interesting thing about the scenic route was it went from Saguaro Cactus to snow in 20 minutes. We actually uh, went up this mountainside, it went, it went from 60 degrees to 35, in literally 20 minutes. And uh, so that was really interesting. And we uh, came out of that and uh, ended up, this is on the other side. So, uh, so it was like a weird, weird thing about that section of Arizona that was kind of interesting. Uh, from there, we decided that we were going to go to uh, Sedona, and um, because it was on the route to Flagstaff, which you know. So anyway, so we went uh, towards Sedona, and we went through the uh, town called Jerome. Jerome was a little interesting town where it was a um, collapsing mining town and a bunch of artists moved in and revamped the whole thing. So it's really interesting in the sense that it's these really tight switchbacks, everything's built up on the side of each hill, and uh, it's all, you know, like galleries and little restaurants and stuff. And uh, that's what is on the other side of the road. So, so you're looking on the hillside of Jerome, and then that's what they're looking at all day. Um, the next one, uh, so we ended up into Sedona. This is, um, excuse my maps, but the, so we're in Sedona, and uh, so this is it. We pull into the town, we start hiking, get a map, start hiking immediately, and uh, what we found out later actually was that uh, uh, when we went to a restaurant there, we asked some guy that had lived there like 40 years, and he was like, hey, so what are the greatest... Uh, what are the greatest little hikes in Sedona? And he's like, well, you should take this trail and this trail, and this is a really great trail I've been taking forever. And just by chance, as it turned out, those were the three trails that we went on. I think he was trying to get a bigger tip, but it was actually like, you know, we were in the right spot. And uh, so um, these are just quick shots of Sedona, the regular uh, landscape. Yeah, we heard. Yeah, again, hiked until about dusk to drive at night again. What and, was the temperature? Uh, uh, the temperature there, we went in the last week of February for the, and the first week of March, and it was, I thought, really great because it was, um, it maybe got down to 45 at night and occasionally got up to a 70 when we were in the desert, so, which was perfect for me, and that's better than 105 or whatever. <laughs> Plus, we missed most of the tourists because we were out of season. You, you, can, hike, you can hike with shorts. We, we did hike with shorts a lot. Uh, you know, have a couple layers and then you know, take them off as it got warm. Yeah, so this is all Sedona. And uh, this is like behind the, behind the town. And uh, obviously, um, the lighting was really good. <laughs> So uh, supposedly there's vortexes here, and uh, you know they talk about like there's supposedly four vortexes in Sedona, and uh, you know one for the male, one for the female, one for like every ailment you have, and <coughs> some other one. But uh, I would say I just want to go back to this. The only vortex was 
like somewhere in uh, this area right here, and right in there. Right in there was the only vortex that I found because I slipped and fell right there. It's like some gravity vortex. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, we got there right after a rain, and it was really a very red clay, as you can see, a real slippery clay soil everywhere. But it's you know still like just really gorgeous. And um, so from Sedona, we went to Flagstaff. I don't know why I chose uh, Monte Vista Hotel. I, actually, I do know why. But as we're driving there at night, you know, the hotel sign is lit and it's like Ho L, is all it says. And we're like, oh, that's the place we're going. And interesting thing about uh, Hotel Monte Vista is Flagstaff is a big college town, and everybody in that hotel, there was a, you know, it was like, um, disco night in the basement there was not we were the oldest people there there was no one over 30 years old in Hotel Monte Vista except for like a two a couple of old prospector guys that were maybe like 70 or 80 but otherwise no you know no one older than 30 and uh, the worst part about it was we were on the fourth floor and their claim to fame is that all the famous movie people that were in Monument National Park north of Page stayed in this hotel and so they have the names of whatever movie stars it was. And uh, we stayed in Humphrey Bogart's room. And I, I believe we really did stay in Humphrey Bogart's room because I don't think they changed the mattress since 1940. It was like hard as rock. The room itself was black. It was like black walls, black paisley bedspread, black curtains, uh, black ceiling, or was it dark blue? black and gold in there. I mean, that was the whole room. And then, you know, this this uh, music was playing outside that whole night, and so, you know, it was like this echo right up to our room. So we didn't sleep at all, but uh, I hope the guy got back together with his girlfriend and he got his skis fixed. I mean, that's all I can remember hearing, you know, until four in the morning, and this guy's problems. Oh, my girlfriend left me. Oh, that's right, they're supposedly at yeah, guests, which I didn't want to mention today, so uh, there are 12 ghosts, supposedly, in this hotel. I don't think I saw one, um, but they told where they had died or what had happened to them and all kind of things. So, uh, so we went from there up to the canyon, and uh, this is our first, and again, like I was saying, because we were out of season, I mean, there's still like, you know, 150 people there, but that's that's nicer than a thousand. And uh, and the weather wasn't bad. I mean, there's obviously snow on the ground, but um, it wasn't cold. But it wasn't cold, exactly. So um, so okay, canyon photos, and everybody's seen a million of them. So I'm gonna like go through these. Pretty did you ride the donkeys down? We did not ride the donkeys. The thing with that is that's that's called Fan Ranch, and uh, if you, I mean, if you wanted to go stay in a hotel that's down there on the river, and Phantom Ranch has like a two to three year waiting list. They only house twelve people, and uh, part of our plan though to stay off the beaten path. That was another thing we wanted to see all the you know the the big landmarks, but we didn't want to see them with the crowds. And one of the things that we hoped to do was as you go along the, the rim road, there is um, several trails. There are several trails that you can actually park and, if you're so inclined, take down to the bottom of the canyon. But they, they obviously warn you, they say this is a turnaround of like five days. But our thought was, oh, we'll just go down the trail two or three hours. We won't see anybody. We'll turn around and come back. But we pass that by too because we were trying, really trying to keep schedule. I mean, it was so easy to, you know, I had a schedule of places I wanted to go, but it's so easy as you're driving to, you know, you're looking at the map and you're like, hey, what's this, like, you know, what's this dinosaur footprint? Let's go see that, you know, and then you're, and then you're like, you've lost three hours. So we were really trying to keep, keep to a schedule. And so, um, I'll get through these canyon ones because everybody's, everybody's probably, oh, there's the, uh, uh, so, um, and you can, you know, like if you're really 
interested in the canyon too. There's obviously the uh, North Rim, which is only open from like May um, to October, and then they close it down because it, there's like it's really remote access to get to it. And uh, but this particular photo, and I don't think anybody can see it, is that I took this picture because um, right here. There's like a drop off right here about 15 or 20 feet and somebody scrambled down that and then walked out here and then walked out and stood on the edge of that rock and uh, I was just terrified to, to look at the footprints there thinking that they were right on the end. You know, obviously it's a, a drop deep into the canyon. Were there any footprints coming back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> So, but it was really scary. I mean, just to, just to see that someone had actually done that it was just like, oh my god, that's like crazy. And uh, so, um, so as we went, okay. The, now this you can see on the upper left. This is like the classic canyon. When you go into the canyon park, upper left is the spot where everybody goes down. You know, initially, and then there's a tra a rim trail that you can just go on for miles and miles and miles, and they have buses that'll pick you up like every mile and a half. You know, when you're like, oh, I really can't go five miles, and you know, a bus comes by. Yeah, so, get you back to uh, the park. To the main park, right? Yeah, get tickets. So, Canyon, Canyon, Canyon. Um, this is the rim trail across the top. Well, that was the thing that everybody was saying constantly was you carry enough water because uh, dehydration is really strong and you never know. And uh, so this is all like a rim trail. Just we walked a couple miles. This is called the uh, uh, desert desert point, and um, this is like the end of the road before you leave the canyon. And uh, this is the view from up in the tower. So you actually get some Colorado there. And uh, interesting thing, as we left, we started to uh, head towards Page because uh, our next part of the trip was to go to uh, a slot canyon. As we're driving down the road, obviously the Grand Canyon had these little uh, little offshoots of it, which were much smaller. But it was very interesting because as you just drove down the road, you'd see these very shallow, I don't know, maybe four or 500 feet, but that, you know, it wasn't Grand Canyon, but it was still a really, you know, dramatic canyon view from anywhere on the road. So what happened is we went to Page, and it was uh, late in the day, and that's up at the top. And so what happened was we, we, uh, our whole trip was all the way to here, and then we made this loop back down to Tomb City to prepare for the next day. And uh, we then went to a slot canyon. Now, the, if you ever see photographs of slot canyons, it's always Antelope Canyon. And Antelope Canyon is like right there. But uh, I was able to find on the internet, there was uh, someone that actually said, um, a naturalist, you know, someone asked them, hey, are there other slot canyons that are not so commercially uh, used? And he suggested like four of them, and I contacted those, and only one was open to the public on Navajo land, and that was Waterholes. And Waterholes is right there. And uh, so that's what we decided to do, but we had to get a day pass from Navajo Nation in this little tiny trailer on the end of this little dirt road where there were like five houses and there it was and uh, we were fortunate enough to get that and then they just said you know drive down here to the bridge five miles away you'll see where the fence is open and go in there and uh, so that's what we did and um, well that was the inside wall of our hotel room and anyway it was, uh, <laughs> so, it was a very really nice color so um, a lot of the, uh, several times through this whole series here, I'm just gonna I just put in photos of driving down the road. Like if you're going from one place to the next, this is what you see, and this is one of those things. Yeah, that's what I, what I the thing about the landscape was just it's so dramatic and so you know amazing. Yeah, it's also everywhere. Slot 
The Slab Canyon is a, a uh, washout sandstone uh, where over so many eons the water has washed it out and it's very, very narrow and undulating and so now you probably know, oh yeah, I've seen those photos. <laughs> also, it's a place where there could be flash floods. Correct. And and the spring water, water, you know, big rains. Yeah. And, you know, so you have, you have to know the weather too. You yeah. can, a couple people got killed either this year this or last past year. Spring. This past spring they got killed drowning in one of the slug mm -hmm. So, but our whole idea was Let's not go to the most famous slot canyon, Antelope Canyon. Let's go to a, a slot canyon where hopefully we won't see anybody so that if we die, nobody will find us for like a month. And that was actually where we ended up because we actually didn't see another person when we were, so this is it. Just drive down the road, we're getting to the slot canyon. We saw another car, but you We never saw people. people. So this is close to the entrance to the slot canyon. And uh, it was really cool. I mean, it was it was great because the thing was, um, the Antelope Canyon. The reason it's so famous is because you drive up to it and you walk in it. This one, we had to actually walk about a half a mile before we can actually scramble down 30 feet to get into the canyon. So it was like this where. As we came into it, they're like, yeah, the canyon there, you're only allowed to go this many miles. But this was the edge of it for about a half a mile. We couldn't get into the canyon. And, uh, but it turned out to be really great. I mean, once we found our way down, this is again, we just keep walking, walking and down. walking and walking. Walk the rim. And looking over the edge, and it's like a sheer drop. First it's 200, then it's 120, and then it's 80 or whatever. And then we finally get into it. Um, but, uh, let's see, and now we're down in the canyon, and um, it's very open at the, at the start, but it gets a lot more dramatic as we moved into it. All these set up, and uh, so this, this is, again, we're walking, we probably walked, I don't know, maybe a mile before we got into the real part of it. And, uh, but there's no one, like I was saying, there's no one there. And um, you can see the you know, striations of the water and how it uh, affected everything. And, uh, and the, the bottom is all sand. And then we were trying to decide how deep the sand might be yeah, right. over all the eons of time. Uh, exactly. Like, how deep was it to begin with? And even like this shot Very here, all those rocks that are there, those are actually the rocks that bore that groove out of the sand just by swirling around with the, the water. And uh, so now we're really starting to actually get into it here. Any rangers around? There was no one. And there was not a soul in this canyon. And that's what made it really enjoyable to agree. And you want that? Real break. And, you know, I don't, who knows how many people go there. But I mean, it was like, again, out of season. and uh, But just a beautiful, beautiful place to be. Were there any footprints in the town? Yeah, certainly. And um, I think I took photos of footprints, too. Or, <laughs> but anyway, um, so I mean, you can see the way the you know how the water washes everything out. It's just really, uh, it's really gorgeous in there. And it kept getting tighter. I mean, it really, you know, it really got tight after a while. Uh, Were there petroglyphs? Uh, yeah. Petroglyphs. Uh, we. We missed the VBRV ranch ones, but we were going to catch up the petroglyphs once we got into the petrified forest. So we did want to see them, for sure. Wait, was that ladder just like left in there? This ladder was left there, sort of bolted to the to the wall. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, where Faye is now, it was still like a four foot uh, to get up onto that platform to continue into the canyon, but there was no hold of any kind, and it was really smooth. So, I mean, I could have boosted her up, she could have thrown me her backpack and pulled me up, right? And then, we, and, then we could have, and then we could have continued on for like another mile, maybe. But uh, we stopped right there. Yeah, that, I don't know. That was at least a couple hours to, to take 
to yeah. that point. This was so potentially should... dangerous, so we yeah. we were we were free to cats. So um, and let's see. Cool. If you want to climb in something like that, I, I had big lug boots on, but what they were was sort of like a soft, smooth, you know, sneaker that was, you know, that would let you get, you know, climb in thing. So that better. We we got into the canyon about 10:30 or something. We tried to get in early. And uh, we, well, we had to find the place to get the, the pass to get in. And then uh, we were there from 10-ish you know, to like two, maybe two or three. And you really didn't, I mean, you're so captivated by the landscape, you're not paying attention much to them. Did you see animals or snakes no or anything? No animals. Uh, nothing. There was nothing. Nothing. No birds, no anything in this area. I think we heard crows. And this is our walk out. Actually, where they told us to walk in, we just didn't go far enough. But as we came out, we're like, oh, we can go this way. And then this was back out on top of it again. You can see it to the left there. Um, and I just took this picture just to show you the top of the whole slug canyon thing and, you know, just the way the weather gets there. How big were those individual, like, mounds? These mounds? Yeah. Two two or three feet wide, maybe, two feet high. I mean, they weren't really that big. This, again, is just looking back into that canyon. See there, the, those converse <laughs> ones. There, yeah, that's my footprint right here. And uh, so we went from the Slot Canyon to, because we were close to another big landmark, we went to the Horseshoe Bend in Colorado. Another famous photograph, you know, Interesting about this one too, you can walk right up to the edge if you yeah, really have the guts. So it's just and, uh, a couple miles away. Yeah. From that a couple miles north. And so this is a couple pictures of the uh, horseshoe bend. They have signs there because people, you have to, you know, you can't just walk up the hill. You can just walk a little way. Yeah, it's like a half a mile. And, and it's deceptive out there because things look like they're kind of flat, but they're not. There's like rises and things, and then you end up walking over a really big hill to get down. Yeah, it was like a half a mile place. walk to the from the road right. from the parking to this. That was another interesting thing too about just our trip. I mean, we actually did 1,500 miles in eight days, and the interesting thing was when you're out on the road and you can see 10 miles of straight road and you only see one car. My average speed was about 88 miles an hour. Occasionally, I wasn't paying attention, and I'd look, and I was doing 95. And the speed limit's 75, so it wasn't like I was breaking the law or anything. But, uh, but I mean, you're like really driving fast, and you don't know it. And, and it's just a nice, wide open road. So. Um, but this place in particular, they had a lot of signs to not get too close to the edge. Yeah because it is sandstone and it can break at any time, evidently. So after I saw those, I said, like, oh, maybe we should. Yeah, let's not get too close. Okay, right on the edge and take a picture. So this, again, here we are driving down the road, and this is what you just see on the side of the road as you're driving. We now decided to head back to Tuba City, and uh, through, actually, Page, and then back down to Tuba City. So we went up to Page. And we were actually we were getting ready to go to uh, Monument National Park in um, above Arizona, um, and then it was getting dusk, and we had. But this is like this is just a, like a normal oh, I'm driving down the road. Look at that kind of thing. And uh, that's what was so great about just driving down the road anywhere in Arizona. So we ended up. So we ended up going, this is where the Slot Canyon and the Horseshoe Bend in Colorado was. We went back up to Page, and then back down to Tuba City, and then over to Canyon de Chez. And Canyon de Chez was another place I really wanted to go. And uh, Canyon de Chez is, um, there are uh, uh, several families of Navajo that live in that canyon have lived there for hundreds of years, their families, and only they are allowed to live there. And this is the place we stayed, which was the Thunderbird Hotel. I recommend it. It's a little beat up, but what I like about it was that, uh, it's a little bit beat. 
1940s. Yeah, but what was nice about it is they had a really interesting art gallery with some really great Indian art, and they had a cafeteria that was open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And from, from this hotel, they actually um, offered tours into the canyon. And again, we didn't want to go on the tour. Is there some way we can get in the canyon? Yes, if you only go this one trail, you're allowed in. Okay, we'll do it. And uh, so that's the start of the trail into the canyon and the upper left. And it, again, it was deceiving too because you know you really thought, ah, just a quick little uh, jaunt down the hillside. Well, we drove quite a ways to, from the uh, trading post from the hotel yeah, to the to get to this point. point. Yeah, right, right. And so this is looking down into the canyon again. And what was, um, this? you know, here and to the left, like over this area, there's some really interesting things that I'm going to show you real soon. There was another reason why you wanted to go there. There's some pictures um, that's down there. Uh, yeah. And um, so this, you know, there's um, the ideal time to actually get there is October. And all those happy trees are right there. It was well, beautiful. There was another thing that there were, like, some plants that were, like, luminous green. Well, here's an interesting thing about, the, as you can see right here, as we were hiking down the trail, this is part of a herd of wild horses. So I've never seen wild horses, and we're hiking down the trail, and they've run through the river, and I'm like, oh, it's real. It's not just in the movies. And that was, that was very exciting, too. Yeah, I mean, and this is just a few of them. I mean, it was... It was, the yeah, there were like 12, 15 of them just running and like, look at that, horses. <laughs> like that's exciting, but it was actually really exciting. And uh, so we're hiking the trail now to get down into it. And there's a couple of caves, or little cutouts we had to get through. Interesting, some of the trail was more narrow than this. This is probably about five feet wide, but some of it was actually, I, I thought it was interesting, because some of it was actually about two feet wide, and there was horse manure on it. And I'm like, you know, did they really leave you know, a donkey or something down these trails? And you can see where it, you know, it switches back yes. right here. And, uh, so it wasn't wild horse poop? <laughs> you know, I wonder if they actually went up that trail. I would not think so, but uh, so, um, so here we're getting a little bit closer. Well, interestingly, as we so go what, down, we're about halfway down, and this older man, Runs by us, and I mean that like we're like ooh, you know, we're, and I, you know, I know, you know how to you know walk and climb and that stuff, but we're not going. This guy's running full pace all the way down. I'm like oh my gosh, and then like a couple women come after him. There are a couple yeah. of Navajo women, and the guy, the older guy, had like like music on him. I don't know what. It was it was just blaring like you know, 1960s. It was creepy. Yeah. But anyway, uh, by the time that we got all the way down in the canyon, those people were running back up. Yeah. So this is still a trail. We, we still. Them, and they're like, oh yeah, we do this every day. Yeah, we still haven't gotten into the canyon yet. We're almost there. I just want to pass. Then now we're at the bottom of the canyon. But uh, there was a real purpose for being down here, and that was actually to. Um, this is down in the canyon. And. Uh, Canyon de Shea had some, you know, some ruins and stone. And it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. It was very quiet there, and there was very much. like a uh, you know, couple of crows and a hawk flying around. So that's Canyon de Shea. And uh, there's a bunch of graffiti from 1873 all over the front of this. Some cowboy. I can't tell you, and I don't remember. They were up quite high. You know, they're not like 
you know, there you would have to scramble up to get to them. So this is our way back out. Then we then uh, we crossed on the pan. Our next plan was from Canyon to Shea down to uh, the Petrified Forest, mm -hmm. and we have very little amount of time to do all this. We actually have about ten more minutes. Well, we, to talk. we met Indians who were selling jewelry down at the Buck Base down there. Yeah. yeah. But so we we came out, went through the Painted Desert because we were gonna like, oh, let's just drive by uh, Petrified Forest. We're not really interested. Oh, maybe we'll just cruise through, take a half hour a couple pictures we ended up staying there about five hours and probably could have stayed longer it was just really again amazing this is actually here's some petroglyphs this is actually uh, a place called newspaper rock and it's in the petrified forest uh, we didn't know at the time um, or at least i didn't know it. we just like scrambled down into these rocks and took a bunch of pictures when we came out actually then i saw the sign that said do not leave the trail but it was, uh, we got a bunch of pictures behind, actually like behind here, there was a bunch of petroglyphs. There's still like deer on there? Yeah, that's Yeah, right here. So uh, we took a bunch of pictures behind the rocks. Which, so you get to see these if you don't want to break the law. Maybe uh, some of these are, that you really can't see from the trail. And uh, so I, I'm not at newspaper rock yet. Some down here. This was like a, there was a um, Indian dwelling near this, very close to this. This is called, this is what's called, uh, um, actually, I this is called just paper rock. So it's on both sides here, it's like completely covered on both sides. Yeah, it's just in a vast plain, and it was like an intersection where people came and left messages for somebody. So we ended up the Petrified Forest after we left there, and this is what the Petrified Forest looks like. And the interesting thing about the Petrified Forest is that um, at one time, I mean this, there's only like 60% of the Petrified Forest is national park land, 40% of it is privately owned, and it's being mined constantly. So, um, you know, they do whatever they want with it. And, uh, but the landscape here, it's just laying around everywhere. And what's cool about the Petrified Forest and reading about it was that uh, at the time of Arizona, when, when the planet was one big continent, Pangaea, Arizona is where uh, Puerto Rico is now, 200 million years ago, it, where Puerto Rico was. So then it finally moved up. So it was tropical, but the thing is, this petrified forest became a petrified forest 100 million years before the dinosaurs roamed. So that, I mean, in the vastness of time, it's pretty amazing. So, um, so Canyon de Chez, petrified forest, and then we made this huge run. We spent a night somewhere around here, and then made our run down to visit his friend Sandy, who has lived in Tucson for about 30 years. Uh, here is the girl, and half the reason we were there. And uh, so, so Sandy decided to take us to um, a place over here called the, uh, um, what is it? Chiricahua. Chiricahua Mountains. And uh, this is also a really amazing uh, place. And, uh, <laughs> So the Chiricahua Mountains. Right down in the Yeah. It's, south. Uh, this is as you're driving to them. This is what the, the it looks like. Yeah, we went from the top of the state all the way down to the you know, uh, corner and or the south of the corner of the state. So as you get into the Chiricahua Mountains, you see this. And then um, finally when you get into it, uh, this is what you see once you get into the trail. And, well, we, um, hiked. we hiked up the big trail. Yeah, we, we did. It took us like half a morning. A lot of balanced rocks everywhere. I mean, like, you know, it's pretty incredible. Um, and there's a, uh, a place that you can go to called Echo Cave, which we went to also, which are these just massive house sized rocks that are balanced on each other and create this sort of false cave. And uh, that was 
pretty interesting too. So this is all the Chiricahua Mountains. They look better on this thing. Yeah, that took a couple of down rock features. What's the road in the rocks? Um, what happened there was several miles away, uh, west of this area, a volcano erupted, laid down everything, and as it washed away, it ate this rock out and created you know, that, that whole landscape. Mm -hmm. Worth thinking balance rocks. I mean, they were like everywhere. That, it was really, I mean, it was very excited. You know, I, it doesn't sound like I'm really excited about it, but believe me, I, every day I was, uh, you're just saying wow. I mean, like Long Island, I had described this to several people, you know, the island and the ocean just has that grandeur and that massive vastness to it. This had a vastness on the monumental scale, where not just the ocean monumental, but I mean, it was just, everything was monumental and, you know, and, and dramatic. And that's, that's why I would always suggest driving in the daylight, wherever you're driving to. So that is, oh, what we did after that, here's Chiricahua Mountains. We then, she took us to Bisbee right here. Bisbee is a mining town that uh, stopped mining in like 1930, but they did not close up the pit. So, and I didn't photograph it because I thought, I've taken all these beautiful photographs, I can't take a photograph of an open pit mine that still is leaching this black water out of it. As you drive down the road, there are these rivers of black water leaching from the, from the residue. But the town of Bisbee has been you know, redone and is really quaint and really cute. And, and all the houses are up on the hillside. So when you go down Main Street, there's no access to the house on, on the, you know, 100 foot left, there's, it's all just stairways, stairways to houses, that's all it is, and it's hundreds of stairs. So we ended up um, going from Bisbee, very quickly here, from Bisbee, we went back to Tucson, and then over here to the Saguaro National Park the next day, and this is Saguaro National Park. So, um, and we were there about a week to two weeks too early, all the cactus was getting ready to bloom. And we were there the first week of March. So everything was just starting at that point. And we saw a coyote. I mean, of all things, we saw a semi sort of like maybe it was what a coyote was fenced in. And I took this bit, just don't tell anybody, I tried, I tried to. I think this without offense, so you really thought I actually saw a coyote. I can't lie. This is in the Swarov Park. It's in the Swarov Park. And they have, you know, you can walk on long days. So that's the park. And uh, so a lot of things were just starting to move uh, up. The interesting thing, this is in the park. This is actually a tortoise. On top of the tortoise is a camel's hoof print to give you some concept of time. And this is in, you know, the Arizona desert. The tortoise with a camel. Petrified. Petrified, yeah. This is this is actually a plaster cast. But but just the idea that at one time there was tortoise, so it had to be wet and then or you know, no. Just a, a camel and a tortoise were at different times, but on that same land. And this is the last of the Zorro National Park. And then uh, we left and headed back to Tucson. And this was before we, you know, we left the park and just went up on the hill like see the everybody else. And then, I mean, there was like 50 people that went here to see the sunset. 
And to me, it was, it was, it was lovely. And, uh, and that's it. So there you go. Did you spend any nights like outside or sleeping outside or? Not at all. I mean, that my plan was the whole trip to my own saying just to have advanced sleeping quarters. Oh, so you ready. did. You had booked places. I had booked places okay. like two days, three days in advance. Actually, if you saw my schedule, like the first three days, I had visit here, stay here, visit here, stay there, visit, and that's. But then after like the fourth day, uh, each hotel, I would get on their computer and then figure out where and how I was going to go to what place and then book a hotel. Yeah. So it was really easy that so way. So that was nice. You weren't too hemmed in. Yeah, we could change But you the could still, you wouldn't have to worry about finding a place. Well, yes, that was a worry of mine. It was just that we couldn't. Uh, it was also the time of year because it was March. It was easy to find other hotels to go to yeah. on the fly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you couldn't do so that, that probably nice. at other times. Yeah. Eight days. Yeah. And the interesting thing, when we were in the travels, when we ended up finding uh, um, Indian artists, uh, all of a sudden we got really caught up in the idea of turquoise and fetishes. And uh, so Faye actually has a fetish necklace that she got from a, an Indian woman that had made that. Can you turn around this way? And, um, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, what is your fetish? When we were in the Chiricahua Mountains, and we just stopped at like a switchback, you know, like the little parking area uh, when you're going down the, the road. There's just a woman there, and she was selling jewelry, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna get this. Yeah, we ended up getting uh, a couple places. There were a bunch of roadside places that were selling, you know, what they claim to be antiques, and it's really not true. And um, you know, there's a bunch of different antiques. Now these are fetishes these too. These are fetishes. Yeah, these are actually really cute. And what's happening now, since you know, in the 1940s was the Indian artists really started uh, signing their work. I mean, the, the, you know, silver making was done at the turn of the century as a way to uh, afford an income. And then, you know, they started adding turquoise to it and then they started, um, you know, everybody started selling jewelry and, well, and this, art. Yeah, and, this type of fetish is not like the real thing because like the Indians uh, were into, um, you know, north, east, south, and west, the four point, you know, ways of going. And um, and so that you had different fetishes that were for, you know, whatever it was you're trying to do. Yeah, if you're hunting, if, you know, if you're hunting so, rabbits, then you get a rabbit fetish. A lot of real Indian fetishes, you'll never see them because they're kept by the tribes and they're like almost Yeah, they're very sacred, fetishes. very private. Yeah, so the, the two fetishes I have, like the bear is a fetish that's used you know, by Indians, but the rabbit is just, just a thing. It's, it's not like one of the true fetish animals. So, Faye, could, I, did I miss, were you talking about what exactly a fetish is in this way? Because the, I... The fetish, it's almost like um, something to meditate on, to... It's a symbolic object. A, right. a symbolic right. object to, or, yeah, you, have a you know, that you're you want made, or like in particular, some of the fetishes were specifically for hunting, so if you're a hunter, you have a specific fetish. If you're a, a mother and a wife and you're someone in the home, you have certain fetishes for making sure that you have all the food you know, that you want. And, you know, yeah, and we, we became really fascinated with turquoise, too. I have a question. How do you keep your fetish? Like you're, actually, there is a very symbolic way that you're supposed to keep supposed and feed your fetish. Keep it's your fetish. One of the ways you're really supposed to keep a fetish is in a little box or some kind of container that you can't see into. You're supposed to feed it corn and then let it like pray. Yeah, I, that's, that, that's what we read. Yeah, and the interesting thing about turquoise that I mentioned before was that um, actually only about 15% of any turquoise is uh, jewelry grade. So 85% of it is uh, adulterated in some manner. Either it has, um, uh, either some kind of epoxy is soaked into it or a plastic is heated into it or there's some kind of manipulation of it. So anything, and it's always mounted on something else. So if you see a, a big ring with a big rock on it, usually you know, 90% of the time, it's really a flat piece mounted on another stone. 
and anything that you think is antique probably is not unless there's some kind of provenance to it. And, um, and there's a ton of um, turquoise coming from China, obviously. And which is funny because you know, we went to the, like the shopping mall and, uh, and I think at JCPenney or something, they bought a huge turquoise necklace for I don't know what, 20 bucks or something. <laughs> it was like, oh my god, I mean, these big turquoise rocks. But, uh, and there's ways of testing turquoise too, so to see you know, what kind of grade it is. But, uh, all right. the Indian tribes that still exist, they all have their private mines. Correct. There's, where, there's, yeah. where they still they mine turquoise and it can for be their traced. own use. The, the turquoise itself has a, a certain um, pattern or uh, you know, vein in it that can be traced to number eight mine or uh, you know, whatever mines there are, a lot of them have been closed, but you know, they're saying there are a lot of them are private that no one knows where they are. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, a huge market of uh, buying and trading turquoise. And more in New Mexico, I think, but Arizona has a lot of it too. I think there's a question over here. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to know when, when on the trails, are they marked? Like, can you easily get lost? Uh, Sedona, Sedona, it was pretty easy. Sedona, I mean, you, you, you actually get yourself like a... They do have trail maps. You know, a ticket yeah. so that you can do it or a license, whatever, for the day. And they give you a map and it shows where all the trails are and they're very well marked. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no. It, I mean, well, I, I was just In thinking... Sedona. Right. Yeah, since so uh, GPS on your phone wouldn't work in certain areas, I'm sure. In the navigation. Yeah, it just depends on, you know, there, there's, there's like... Everybody seemed to have some kind of map that was at least rudimentary to figure out where yeah. they were. Um, well, I decided to buy a really nice uh, digital SLR and not learn how to use it until we went on this trip. <laughs> so that was part of the mistake. But I mean, it was uh, the learning curve was quick. What kind of camera was it? It was a Canon, Canon uh, 6D. 60D. A, uh, what is it, a um, 28 to 105 lens. So it, was, it had, you know, macro and slight you know, telephoto. Yeah. But, um, it was, it, it, you know, I ended up taking, I mean, I really, it took me a long time to just get down to these photos. And uh, there I took hundreds and hundreds, thousands, I took a thousand photos. I, I would, we would recommend taking that trip in at least two weeks. Yeah, that and was not driving like that was really miles, like every day. This was it's sort of like miles. almost like a almost like a yeah. you know a test to see what's out there first and then come back kind of idea. Yeah. But it was still really fun and like I said, the amount of road time is enjoyable if you like driving and just observing the landscape yeah. as you go because that you know as tired as we were every day that kept me awake just just seeing the countryside. It was really exciting. There seemed to be a lot of flowers in bloom in the early March. Yeah, we were just the, a little early. Yeah, yeah. the Suaro Desert. Those museums, we there's like week. two different Last Suaro Deserts. And the one was just full, like it was just ready to burst. And then where our friend lived in Tucson, she had cactus out front of her house that were blooming. And people in the neighborhood had cactus that were blooming because it's a little bit warmer where they are, you know. But, uh, it was a different kind of beauty that I didn't think I was going to like it. <laughs> yeah, the interesting thing about Suaro cactus is that each arm uh, takes 75 years to produce. So that's another amazing that thing. Each arm of the Suaro cactus takes 75 years to produce. Can they produce two arms at once? I don't know. That's a good question. That's a Google question. Like that, yeah. That's cheating then. That means 35, right? They 37, start out a little 37 with years and each. Grow up so you can see them. <laughs> well, well, I'm going to look that up. Thank we'll you talk about very that much. I'd, I'd like to go there and do this trip. I hope so. I was, it was worth going. I would not mind going back again, but I think we might try to do that in New Mexico. She has, a, she has another college friend that lives in New Mexico. Oh, okay. <laughs>